So on to our next speaker. It is my pleasure to introduce Loretta Hidalgo Whitesides, who is a future astronaut with Virgin Galactic and the co-founder of Yuri's Night. She studied astrobiology at Stanford and Caltech and wants to use the power of space to shift our perspectives, connect us with each other and our home planet and become the kind of species we would be proud to send to the nearest star. Welcome, Loretta. Thank you, Lucinda. And uh, hello, Mars Society. It's great to be back. Um, I want to start with a little show and tell. Um, this is a rock I got to bring back from my time at Houghton Crater, up where uh, the Mars Flash Line Station uh, was built. And uh, it's up in Northern Canada in the, in the Canadian Arctic. And this is actually a shattering cone. I don't know if you can see the detail on the side, but basically when that meteorite hit the earth, it melted all the rocks and made this distinctive shatter cone shock pattern throughout all the rocks. And uh, this rock actually has um, a fossil in it as well. So as a biologist and astrobiologist, I was pretty excited to find a shatter cone that also had a, a fossil in it while we were uh, doing our research up there. Um, but anyway, so it's great to be here. I'm gonna, let's see, sh I'm gonna do my team, IT magic here. Share screen, PowerPoint. So last time I was at the Mars Society Conference, it was in 2017. Uh, we were down in Irvine and um, my title slide was, um, small so I can see what I'm doing here. Um, can Mars make us better people? And since that time, I realized that I think I asked the wrong question uh, because I don't think that Mars can make us better people. I think the only thing that can make us better is ourselves. And so I decided to update it for, for my 2020 talk so it's now, are you up for the challenge of bringing your best self to Mars? So we, you know, we heard some great talks from Elon yesterday and talked about growing food on Mars this morning and the radiation challenges and the political challenges. Um, and now I wanna talk about like the human challenge, like uh, what it's gonna take for us to survive as a species is gonna take us being our best selves. If we bring, uh, you know, our arrogant, jerky, you know, grumpy, for me, angry, uh, combative selves to Mars, you know, it won't be that sci-fi future that we've dreamed of, that we're inspired by, that I love, you know, if it's Star Trek or Star Wars, I'm, I'm bipartisan, whatever, whatever, whatever sci-fi you like. Um, you know, we won't have that future on Mars. It'll just be, you know, uh, same problems, different planet. So I'm really interested in, can we do the cultural development we need to do to go along with all the technological development, all the rocket development, all the propulsion development that we're doing? Um, and that's, that's where, what I'm interested in, what I'm passionate about. Um, and so uh, I've been doing this for a long time. I started off my journey uh, with helping using space to bring out the best in the people by starting Yuri's Night back in 2001. So 20 years ago now, uh, this coming year will be our 20th anniversary of Yuri's Night. We're very excited. My husband and I started that uh, back in uh, 2000. And uh, Yuri's Night's all about making space cool, bringing people together, and helping us connect at a heart level and bringing together art and, and space and um, you know, remembering that we're all in this together and, and that remaining that it doesn't matter if it's a Russian holiday or a US holiday, um, that, that space has the power to bring us together and that um, we're, all we're all unified by our love of space. So unfortunately this year with COVID, we weren't uh, able to party under the Space Shuttle Endeavor like we normally do. Um, but we were able to have a uh, fantastic event at the uh, South Pole Station where there no social distancing was required um, at uh, Gell Gellager's Pub down there. Um, so we had to sort of rejigger things a little bit this year. And, um, oh, sorry, that's a video. Well, yeah, that's what I wanna do. Okay, so now I've gotta do some more Technico Jizmo Yaging. And we're gonna go to video. Um, so we transferred to an all online event, just like Mars Society's done. Space people are adaptable and innovative, so we made it happen. Um, also, thanks to um, the Tomorrow Show. And so um, it was a fantastic event. It was a like a four five hour live stream, which was amazing. Um, and we were able to get an incredible wealth of guests we wouldn't have otherwise. I'm just going to play the first uh, two minutes of it or so. Just to, we had um, Robert Picardo from uh, Star Trek uh, who played the uh, Holographic Doctor and Voyager uh, kick us off, and I wanted to share that with you just to give us give you a taste of uh, of, of a little bit Yuri's Night global webcast.
I love Yuri's night. Who doesn't want to celebrate the first human in space? Especially now, as we are about to enter the most exciting decade for space exploration since Yuri's decade, the 1960s. In the 2020s, we could see humans back on the moon, humans returning to deep space. There are missions planned that will bring us closer than ever before to the detection of life on another world that the Planetary Society CEO, Bill Nye, claims will make each and every one of us feel differently about our place in the cosmos. I have been to a number of Yuri's Night celebrations since the very first one on April 12, 2001, which was the 40th anniversary of Yuri Gagarin's historic flight. I love this event because it celebrates an achievement for all humanity, not one nation over another. Gene Roddenberry's Star Trek, which premiered in the 1960s, in 1966 at the height of the Cold War, envisioned a future in which space exploration brings humankind together toward a common goal of discovery and adventure. In the same way, Yuri's Night celebrates unity. We achieve great things when we work together. Now, right now, because of COVID-19, we have to work together by staying apart. But I hope you'll agree that that makes this Yuri's Night more important than ever. We have to celebrate while we isolate. Remember that Yuri's courageous voyage on April 12, 1961, in a tiny little thimble called Vostok 1, was about as isolated as any human could be. Let's all direct our global efforts toward the goal of a Yuri's Night a year from now, 2021, the 60th anniversary, when we will all be side by side celebrating safely together with COVID-19 conquered by the very science and discovery that we celebrate tonight. Happy Yuri's Night. <laughs> Video, but you can catch all five hours live on YouTube. Just Google uh, Yuri's Night Global Webcast 2020, and you can check it out. Where there's some other really fun stuff in the video, including um, uh, you know we were able to get five astronauts to come online in one night. And normally we'd only have one or two at the event, so it was really a neat. And it was right at the beginning of COVID too. You know we went into quarantine on um, at least in California on March 12th, um, and this was April 12th. So it was a really quick turnaround to, to pull this off, um, but we were able to get. Chris Hatfield, Soyun Yi, talking about her time getting walked out to the Soyuz pad by Valentina Tereshkova. Just unbelievably cool stuff. Um, we had astronaut uh, Scott Kelly, who spent a year on the space station, uh, geeking out about space and music with Bob Weir of the Grateful Dead, which was really a treat to watch. He was like, he's a Grateful Dead fan. He's like, well, I'll be on. Can I bring my friend Bob Weir? And we're like, yeah, that sounds super cool. So that was really fun to watch them just hanging around, talking talk shop for a bit. Uh, we, we had Bill Nye come on and, and talk, which was fantastic. Uh, and we were able to give our Spirit of Yuri's Night Award to uh, Duran Duran. And uh, so Nick Rhodes was able to make an appearance on the webcast as well. So we, we were super proud. It was an amazing event uh, and we really enjoyed it a lot. And now we're getting ready for our event next year, April 12th, 2021, uh, or April 10th, if you wanna do it on the Saturday before. Um, we don't know yet if we'll be able to do any in-person events, uh, but we'll definitely be doing a webcast again because it was just so much fun and such a powerful opportunity to hit that global scale, which we really enjoyed. So I hope you'll, um, if you can do an event locally where you are, come, to, come become part of the Yuri's Night family, host your own event in your city. Uh, everyone's welcome. And if you, uh, or you can just join, check in our webcast next year as well, and we'll have lots of fun and games and dancing for you next year. It'll be the 60th anniversary of human space flight. So Yuri Gagarin flew into space. The first human to fly to space was April 12th, 1961. And the, um, so it'll be 60th anniversary of Yuri. It'll be the 40th anniversary of the US space shuttle. So STS-1, Space Shuttle Columbia flew to space on its inaugural mission on uh, April 12th, uh, 1980, 81. Uh, so 20 years later to the day. So it'll be the 40th anniversary of the space shuttle, first space shuttle. And it'll be the 20th anniversary of Yuri's night because we launched our first party on April 12th, uh, 2001. So 
uh, it's a big conjunction next year. We're really excited. We're going to go big. So I hope you'll be part of that and support us and join us for um, Yuri's Night 2021. So after Yuri's Night, um, you know, I got involved with Virgin Galactic. I became a founding astronaut. I have a ticket to fly on a suborbital space mission, hopefully in the next, you know, year or two. So I'm really excited for that. That's been my uh, childhood dream. You know, since I was six years old, I wanted to go into space. So I'm very excited for that opportunity to see the Earth from space with my own eyes and, and spend a little bit more time in weightlessness than I have on my, uh, my time as a zero-G flight director, uh, which was incredible. Zero-G is really fun. And um, so in my time at um, Virgin Galactic, I really got interested in how do we bring out the best in people, not just um, those of us who are going into space, but also the people um, who are designing the ships, the people who are building the ships, people who are turning the wrenches. Everybody on our team needs to be operating at their best and their most extraordinary. And so I came up with this, uh, uh, this concept that the most complex subsystem of the spacecraft is the team building it and started working on um, training teams on how to you know, bring out the best in themselves and hold themselves, raise the bar on themselves. So, you know, so I'm not picking up my hangnails. So I'm cleaning up my relationships with people that I've gotten estranged from so that I'm not swearing at my kids when I get mad, uh, you know, those little things that make a difference in life and just being able to enjoy your life and enjoy your achievements. And that's really important. You know, I, I had the pleasure of uh, meeting Dr. Chris McKay when I was at, at Stanford. Um, and in 1993, as a freshman, I got to go to the, the Case for Mars conference where I first met Bob Zubrin um, back, back in the day. And one of the um, fabulous things that I learned from Chris, uh, Dr. McKay is amazing amazing mentor to me, uh, was that happy people do better work. And so one of them, so what really the work that I'm doing is how do we, how do we keep our, ourselves and our teams and our industry happy so that we can um, get along, so we can work well together. You know, it, to me, it takes more than ISO 9000 standards and being professional to really orchestrate something as complex and challenging as a Mars mission. You know, you're just going to be, you know, a lot, many months until your return window come, opens up to be able to come home. You got many light minutes separating you from you know, your normal support systems back home. You know, COVID's taught us like how much important all those things are. And you won't be able to take a walk out in a forest or up on a map to, um, or to the ocean to um, you know, recharge your batteries and, and, and get your focus back. So we really need to come up with really strong systems for taking care of our own well-being and take care of our, taking care of our, team, our team dynamics, our team interactions, which we all know can get really dicey anywhere and like you see in, in TV all the time. So um, I did been doing uh, leadership training and development at Virgin Galactic for the last five years. And thanks to COVID was able to launch it online and open it up to the whole world, which I'm super excited about. So we now have uh, space kind training. Uh, we did the, launched the first one on May the 4th be with you because I'm a Star Wars geek and uh, just launched our second space kind training back in August. And we're launching our third space kind training on uh, January 11th. And so I hope, and if you're interested in spending uh, eight sessions with an awesome group of people, challenging yourself, doing your own hero's journey, working to bring out the best in yourself, so you're ready for the challenges of Mars, come join us, spacekind.org. Um, the, the class is based around the book, my, my book, The New Right Stuff, Using Space to Bring Out the Best in You. We read a chapter every week. There's conveniently seven chapters. Uh, and it's, it's, um, it's a lot of fun with the story. I, I have low attention span, so the book is not very academic, it's, it's pretty entertaining. It's got lots of fun stories about my adventures and, and misadventures in my career. So it's a lot of fun. Um, keep perspective. Um, let's see, my husband likes to say that uh, from low earth orbit, all your problems look small. And so one of the things I like to remind uh, people, space, our space kind community, all of you, is that, um, you know, the things that we think are really a big deal, you know, maybe are not such a big deal. You know, maybe they weren't trying to offend you. Maybe it, they weren't, it wasn't personal. Um, sorry. So, and one of the things I love about space and, and all of us, and one of the things that unites us is the idea that space can give us that perspective and, you know, take a step back and take a measure before we react. And, um, and gratitude is a great antidote. I have a raging temper and I, I find that, Gratitude is one of the things that is the best antidote. It helps me a lot. And so, and I think us as space people, we have a lot more 
opportunities for gratitude because we don't take things for granted. Like I've said before, we don't take oxygen for granted. We're like, oh my gosh, this planet has breathable one atmosphere oxygen. This is epically cool. This is amazing. I could just walk outside without pre-breathing in the, in the uh, airlock. This is fantastic. You know, we don't take gravity for granted. We're like, wow, when I put my pen down, it stays on the desk. That's fantastic. We're so lucky. This is great. You know, we don't take water for granted. We're like, wow, look at all the abundant liquid water on the surface of this planet. This is unbelievably cool. Let's protect it. Let's savor it. Like, let's celebrate it. It's fantastic. So that perspective, that gratitude helps keep us as space people um, humble and healthy. And I love, you know, and to be able to spread that and make and help other people have that space perspective, that orbital perspective, that overview effect. The, the rest of the planet learn to um, appreciate ourselves, each other, ourselves and our home planet, I think will make a huge difference. Um, one of these things should make it the slide go. There we go. It's not the mountain we conquer, but ourselves. So I added this slide in. Uh, I really, Edmund Hillary, of course, being the famous Everest uh, summit uh, mountaineer who summited Everest. Uh, from New Zealand, he's fantastic. Um, quote says that it's not the mountain we conquer, but ourselves. So this is, I want to really important to me to remind all of us who love space so much to keep in perspective that space is not the answer. Like getting to the moon, getting to being the first person to walk on Mars, oh, this is sacrilege, isn't going to make you happy. Now, how do I know that? Because if you look at um, Buzz Aldrin. Um, you know, he's selected as a NASA astronaut, got, he's a member of the Apollo 11 crew. He's one of the most famous astronauts on earth. And when he came back from the moon, he was horribly depressed and he battled alcoholism for 10 years. So we have to do the work before we go to be healthy, to be well, to, to, to work through all of our frustrations and challenges and issues so that we're at peace with ourselves so that we're comfortable on our own skin, so that when you walk and take that first step on the surface of Mars, you can experience all the joy and all the fulfillment and all the satisfaction that comes from that. And you can be a fantastic role model for everybody who's watching you back on Earth. You guys are like, wow, that person is so together. They have such great relationships. They're so calm and level-headed. I still striving for these things myself. It's a journey, but that's what we, but that's what I wanna invite us to be on. It's not just the technical journey, but invite you to be on the personal journey as well, because that's what it's gonna take. There's so many famous people. There's so many gold medalists who reach these incredible heights, who get the Academy Award, who make the money, who have the acclaim, but because they haven't worked out who they are and what matters to them and how to maintain their equilibrium and their peace and their relationships, like it becomes too much. And so really an invitation to uh, take on the next level of your space training. So of course, you know, wouldn't be complete without a cartoon from um, Calvin and Hobbes. If people sat outside and looked at the stars each night, I bet they'd live a lot differently. So I'm, I'm really interested in, in, in that challenge of, you know, can we, can you give up sarcasm? Can you give up heated arguments? Can you give up that, that addiction to being right? Is that, can you make Mars and our mission and our, our survival as a species more important than our individual ego needs? Um, that's, that's the challenge and that's what um, it's gonna take for us to succeed on the final frontier. So um, excited to have you all uh, check it out um, and join us and become a part of uh, our space kind family. Thanks so much for having me this morning and uh, at Astra. Thank you, Loretta. Um, we have a few questions here. I just like to um, comment about the psychological um, aspect you were discussing. And I think that may be underestimated and I really appreciate you bringing that to our attention because it is extremely important if you're gonna be in a module for six months going to Mars <laughs> in close quarters. And, and uh, thank you so much for bringing that up. I have a question from Inara. She would like to know, uh, she would like to comment and have, and she has a question. Yuri's night is amazing. Any chance of getting a similar celebration for Valentina Tereshkova? <laughs> That's a great question. So amazingly, there's a similar bizarre conjunction of anniversaries with Tereshkova. 
because and and Sally Ride. So you have the first Russian woman, um, and the, uh, flew in. I think it was June sixteenth, June fourteenth. I always screw it up. Well, it was either the fourteenth or sixteenth, nineteen sixty three. And then Sally Ride flew on June fourteenth or sixteenth, uh, nineteen eighty three. So again, twenty years later, and twenty years and two days apart, these two women, the first Russian woman and the or Soviet. Russian woman and the first American woman went into space. So it's an incredible conjunction of events again. So yeah, celebrating the women of space. And I I, um, I will say that the book, if you've heard of the book Owens Fellows, which are incredible group of women, young women who um, do fellowships throughout the space industry every year. If you're an undergrad, I, uh, I definitely encourage you to apply to become a Brooke Owens Fellow. It's an incredible program. And they have taken up the mantle of um, Valentina's Day, which is incredible. They have a, uh, event every year that they do internally just to gather themselves, but there's no reason we can't grow that and take it out uh, to celebrate uh, the power of women, especially with Artemis coming up. I don't know, this could be a big opportunity next year to take Valentina's day to the next level. It's a great idea, I love it. Thank you so much. Um, I have several different types of questions. Um, so I'm just gonna send them out your way. Okay. Um, this is from Thazen. For me, as a girl from an underprivileged society, how would I prepare for my undergraduate specialization in astrobiology? Yay, I love astrobiology. Um, well, there's a great uh, section in, in the book where I talk about May, Dr. Mae Jameson. She's the first African-American woman in space. And she came to Virgin Orbit and gave a talk to our women engineers, which is incredible. And in it, she talks, uh, she's asked a question by one of the engineers about how do you deal with imposter syndrome? You know, that feeling like, you know, I'm an underdog or I don't fit in or I don't belong here. Um, and you can have that a lot when you're starting to go into your, in, in your college training, um, especially in a technical field and feeling out of sorts. And, and what she said, I'll pass on her advice, which I thought was great, which is be like a cat. She said, have you ever seen a cat who didn't think it had every right to be exactly where it was? And uh, so we, we like to joke it, it, uh, in our space kind training that when you're having imposter syndrome, you just got to channel your inner feline and be like, I belong here, right here on this couch. This is where I belong. Um, so that takes a lot, a lot of uh, courage. And then there was someone else who gave come a, a quote or, or advice lately online somewhere, but I can't remember who's, where it's from. One of you might know, but um, that idea that you don't have to um, worry about impressing everyone. You just have to worry about impressing the people that you respect and admire. There's a lot of trolls out there and you can't please everyone. Um, but if you find somebody, a mentor um, or guide in, at college or university that, that you really respect, you know, make sure that you're right by them and are doing your work and, and doing what you need to do. And don't worry about the noise. Great point. Thank you so much. Because there is a, nowadays there's a lot more noise than there was before. <laughs> and so to follow up, um, Arshin wants to know who was your idol growing up or mentor? Who did who helped you through? Um, well, I already mentioned mentors. One of my mentors was Chris McKay. But it, but when you said that, for some reason, what first jumped to me was um, fictional characters. And I I like to say you know Princess Leia was a big role model for me, you know, I just thought, you know, I'm not gonna be an astronaut when I grow up, I'm gonna be a space princess. And I just loved how powerful she was and how fearless and fierce. And she, you know, would somebody get this walking carpet out of my way and, you know, would, the more you tighten your grip, the more star systems will slip through your fingers. You know, she just um, had some moxie that I always really admired. And then of course, um, well also, I was telling someone this yesterday, Hawkeye Pierce from MASH, she was a doctor, he was really smart, really, you know, blazing fast wit, but he was also um, really nice and really um, funny. And so he, a lot of these role models taught me you could be smart and cool at the same time, which was important to me, you know, as a, as a nerdy, well, I was not nerdy, not nerdy, but as a technical kid. Um, and then the other one was a uh, real genius, his character. Okay, that's enough. Wonderful. I also love Princess Leia. <laughs> um, for all the same reasons. Okay, so uh, someone else would like to know, what is the best experience that somebody has had at Yuri's night that you can remember something wonderful? <laughs> We've had a number of people get married out of Yuri's night. So I thought that was really cool. Um, there's a science fiction writer, Vanna Bonta. She met her husband, um, um, Alan there. And that, that, worked, that turned out pretty well. There's also a cosmonaut named Yuri 
who um, ran into a, a Russian, they were at, he was training in Houston. So he went to the Houston Yuri Snipe party and he ran into this uh, Russian translator woman that uh, he'd met before, but had lost track of. And they reconnected at Yuri Snipe Houston. And not only did they get married, but they got married while he was in space. Because luckily Texas has these crazy laws where you can marry someone who's not in the room. And so she went to the chapel. He was in space, you know, teleconning in, whatever, what have you. And it was a sort of the first space wedding. So I thought that was pretty interesting. That is awesome. Good to, good to hear that story. Um, can you describe your time at FMARS and what you remember the most? Oh my gosh, I had such a fantastic time at Hot and Crater. I was with Pascal Lee um, and, you know, it was 24 hours of sunlight, which is just intoxicating. I just love it. You know, it's like you finish dinner, it's like nine o'clock and you're like, okay, what do we do now? I'm like, oh, I don't know. Let's go on an ATV traverse. And so we'd go out and, uh, you know, you have this beautiful, uh, you know, like, Photographers love the light at sunset. They called it golden hour. It would be golden hour for like six hours. And we'd just be out riding, take these gorgeous shots at midnight, just golden hour, like sunset kind of shots. And then, you, you know, you come back to your tent at like two in the morning and you just collapse because you're, you're exhausted and you didn't even realize it because you're just so juiced up by all the sunlight. And so um, that was tremendously fun. And thank you so much. Um, our last question is, um, why are you excited to eventually fly on the Virgin Galactic Spaceship 2? Well, one of the things that I really love about being a Virgin Galactic future astronaut is that um, it's getting to work with uh, Richard Branson because he's just an extraordinary role model for me, someone who's definite role models. He's so fun, kind, present, you know, self-effacing. He's great with his staff. He's always, you know, remembering people's names and um, being just thoughtful and, and remembering things. And so getting to be part of his vision is um, fantastic. And the people we've built, brought together, you know, there's like 700 future astronauts. And I really am inspired that we could become a force for good on the planet. You know, so I'm like space ambassadors that are, you know, be able to have somebody who's been to space that you could talk to in your language, in your country, in your discipline, all, you know, distributed in 58 countries around the world. And I'm really excited to become a part of that alumni group and be able to inspire them and inspire the people I talk to, to and share our message about um, how fragile our earth is and how we need to come together to uh, take care of it and, and bring out the best in each other. And so just to finish, um, since I know we're running out of time, I just wanted to share one last story, which is that when I was, um, as, as my air conditioning kicks on, I was straight, when I was just out of college, I went down to Johnson Space Center and I was working in the astronaut office in Houston, Texas, which is an incredible place to, to be right at you know 21. And I had the privilege of getting to work with um, Dr. Chuck Brady, who was a NASA astronaut, and he had just come back from his first space mission. Uh, I think it was SCS-78. And um, we just really hit it off and he, he because um, he's like, Loretta, you know, I've just come back from space and, and I finished my Goodwill tour and now they just want me to have a desk job. But all I want to do is talk to people about space. And, um, and I was, all I wanted to do was talk to astronauts about their experience in space. So I was like, oh, I will listen to you all day long. And it's just incredible getting to meet him, getting to, to, to listen to his stories firsthand. And um, sadly, a number of years later, I was at a conference and I ran into a, a flight doc, a flight surgeon. I was like, oh yeah, how's it going? I was like, oh yeah, how's, how's Chick Brady doing? I haven't talked to him in years. I, I love that guy. And he sort of gave me this strange look and he said, you haven't heard? And I said, no. And he said, oh, Chuck Brady died of apparently self-inflicted wounds. Um, you should look it up. And so uh, I just wanted to send out that last message that like none of us are immune. Uh, I like to take the premise that all of us need help and social emotional support. You know, we, you know, that we, you can see in the in the uh, Netflix a way that you know the the psychologists are sort of, you know, not truly trusted. So we need to find ways to take care of ourselves and take care of each other so that um, you know bad things don't happen. Anyway, so I'll leave it there. It's eleven o'clock. Thank you, Lucinda. Thank you, Mars Society. And now we have my fabulous husband coming up.